study of Santa Monica's Garden Garden study, which compared the water use, green waste generation, and the number of maintenance hours between a traditional garden, which had a lawn, and Mediterranean climate plants, as seen here on the left, and the native plant garden on the right. This study took place over a nine-year period. If you'd like to look this up yourself, you can Google City of Santa Monica and garden slash garden. So here are the results of this nine year long study. And this is such a great graphic, I love it. If we look at this chart on the left in blue is the amount of water used by the traditional garden. On the right in blue is the amount of water used by the native plant garden in the same time period. You can see that the native plant garden used about 20% of the water that the traditional garden did. The middle column in green is the amount of green waste generated. What this translates into is either you mowing every week and pruning, or you're paying someone else to do that. The right side in green shows how much less green waste is generated in a native plant garden. And the purple shows the number of maintenance hours required for each garden. When the people with the traditional garden are spending 80 hours mowing, mowing and raking and weeding, the people with the native plant garden on the right are spending just 15 hours to maintain their garden. Those native plant gardeners can be using that time to do more fun things or saving the money they would be spending on a landscaping service. In summary, this study showed that the native plant garden used 80% less water, generated half of the green waste, and required 70% less maintenance than the traditional garden. So if you'd like to save money on your water bill and leave water in the natural environment for wildlife to use, if you'd rather be spending your weekends relaxing or having fun with your family instead of pruning or mowing or having to earn the money to pay for those services, then the native plant garden is the way to go. So now we have a word from East Bay Mud. In March, Ebb Mud's board declared that the Ebb Mud service area is in a stage one drought. What this means is that everyone is being asked to come together in order to reach a 10% reduction in water use. Sustainable landscaping, like the garden seen on the Bringing Back the Natives Garden Tour, are a critical part of water conservation. If you still have a lawn and are thinking of making the switch, Ebb Mud's landscape rebates can help. Eligible residents can receive 75 cents per square foot of lawn converted with additional rebates for efficient irrigation up to $2,000. If you already have a garden, EBMUD has just updated their mulch coupons, which are available for local nurseries. You can check out both these programs and other ways you can save outdoors and inside your home by visiting ebmud.com slash water smart. Before we start with our next presentation, I'd like to ask if you would like to type your questions into the chat boxes on Zoom or YouTube, and we'll get to as many questions as we can today. Well, we'll be talking with Robin Grossinger from the San Francisco Estuary Institute. His presentation is Making Nature's City, Using Historical Ecology and Urban Ecology to Bring Biodiversity Back to Our Cities. This presentation will explore how native plant gardens can be connected to the surrounding ecological landscape to maximize the benefits to urban biodiversity. We'll look at how we can learn from the local landscape, both past and present, to guide complementary actions at the garden, neighborhood, and city scale. Robin Grossinger is a senior scientist at the San Francisco Estuary Institute where he directs SFEI's Urban Nature Lab. His work was recently featured in a global urban lecture by the United Nations. Robin has been recognized with a Local Hero Award from Bay Nature Magazine, and his work has been featured by media from NPR to the New York Times. Robin is a former colleague of mine as we worked together at the San Francisco Estuary Institute many years ago. Hi, Robin. Are you with us, Robin? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Can you hear me? 
I can. Anything? Let me stop sharing my screen. That will okay. allow you to uh, to join us here. So I love history, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Yes. Well, thanks. It's great to be here, Kathy. So I know you spent quite a bit of time looking at old maps, reading historical descriptions about the Bay Area, and thinking about what it was like here 300 years ago. Um, shall we just leap right into your talk? Sure. Okay, sure. go ahead then, Robin. Okay, I can share now. Have you, it looks like I don't have access to share yet. Okay, I should probably stop sharing my screen. Do I, let me see how I do that. Can you help me? So Kathy, all you need to do is right click on Robin's name under panelists and give him co-hosting privileges, which will allow him to share his screen. Okay. All right. There, now you should be enabled. Yes. Okay, it's loading. Uh, can you see my first slide there? Is that showing up? Okay, I'm gonna assume it is. I can see, yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kathy. Um, it's great to be part of the tour. It's just a fantastic event. And, um, you know, in a way, what I'll be talking about is giving some, a bit of a science context and, and sort of support for a lot of the things that I see all of these great leaders in urban ecology are already doing. So, um, but yeah, I think my job here is to, uh, step back and think about how do we maximize um, biodiversity or the contribution of our yard and our neighborhood to the ecology of our of our area and like how, how, how does that yard play a role in bringing back some of the lost landscapes and functions that uh, that we we have lost in in our in our cities so um, as Kathy mentioned I've spent I guess 25 years now researching the historical ecology of California and learning about how we, how we, what we lost, the, the landscapes we've, we had, like these wetlands and riverine, riparian, broad riparian corridors of the Delta, and thinking about how we can get them back or elements or components, functional aspects. The beaches of San Francisco Bay, here's a view looking at Albany Hill um, and then the East Bay where Golden Gate Fields and the freeway are today. You know, or the, the vast Valley Oak savannas of, of the South Bay, which turned into orchards, which turned into residential communities, or the Oaks of Oakland, um, the, the unique land of oaks. That, um, and this is the same intersection as that painting. And uh, while we can't, clearly can't get back the big uh, former wetlands and rivers and kind of wildlands in the cities. We're going to need South Bay salt ponds and Delta restoration and um, all the great work we're doing in the uplands for those places. We did start to realize that there were a lot of things in the lowlands, in the developed areas that we've lost that aren't necessarily going to come back in those other areas. So this is a historical mapping of Santa Clara Valley. And you can see the oak savannas and the orangish yellow the uh, grassland wildflower meadows and the yellowish, beigeish, light green are wet meadows. The dark green are the giant willow groves, riparian corridor, corridors, and um, the blue wetlands. And many of these features aren't going to come back in the hills. Um, they're missing elements of the landscape that we need to bring back um, as best we can in the urban setting. So we start to realize as we go from that and realize the lost legacy in the contemporary landscape that, uh, that conservation in the urban areas is kind of a missing piece between the great work we're doing around the bay and the great work we're doing in the hills. We need some, we need to do better in the areas where we live. And in fact, we've recently published a paper in bioscience led by my colleague, Erica Spotswood, um, addressing what, um, you know, what you might call the biological deserts fallacy of cities, um, which is the idea that cities are inherently just going to be bad for biodiversity. And it's true, developing a city is bad for the habitats that used to be there. But once we have cities, um, how they're designed can actually affect um, their ability. They can actually make many positive contributions to regional biodiversity. And so this paper um, documents those from research around the world and um, the different pathways for supporting 
uh, for making positive contributions. Those can be, as this diagram shows, stopover habitat for migratory species, which have to pass through the city and need to find resources along the way to continue their, their calorie um, consuming flights. Um, or the middle, middle bullet there, increasing regional habitat heterogeneity. Essentially what I just talked about, that there's, there's things we can get and resources that can be provided in the cities um, that you often can't get in the, in the other areas. Also, there's an interesting phenomenon where in cities, there's a lot of challenges for wildlife, but they can be reduced, removed from some, some um, pressures. For example, valley oaks, oaks tend to regenerate better in more developed areas than they do in the wildlands where they're often um, really hindered by, by grazing. Or wildflowers um, may do better in urban areas and more be, be greater floral diversity because we're willing to spend the time to weed as so many of the talks have talked about. We are willing to do that and to plant and weed and create native wildflower meadows that may not be able to, to survive against the, the pressures of invasive grasses in the more wild land. So interestingly, the cities can play a role. Now, um, we've also been doing research on the ground to understand this, these um, concepts here locally. Um, and so this is research in more of an office park than a residential setting, but the same factors of how much pavement, how much trees, how much vegetation. This is a research supported by the Google Urban Ecology Program in collaboration with San Francisco Bird Observatory and HD Harvey. And um, this is really fresh data that we're just analyzing now, but it's really fascinating. So I wanted to share it with you. Um, it shows on the x-axis, so we have two categories, poor and good quality. Um, horizontally here, we have the, at the neighborhood scale, how good is the habitat surrounding you? And on the vertical scale, we have how good is the habitat at your site? And of course, when you have poor site and neighborhood habitat quality, you get fewer birds in this case. At least you actually get 18 birds. But that's going to be the very common urban exploitive species like crows and pigeons and towhees, um, relatively common birds. When you improve your site quality, like the kinds of things we're talking about doing in these seminars, more than 50% more birds. These weren't even necessarily as great site improvements as you could imagine. So that number probably can go higher. But then um, if, you if you go to a place with better surrounding neighborhood, quality, but still a very poor quality site, you also have more birds. So interestingly, that can somewhat overcome the limitations of your site. But if you have both good quality site and good quality neighborhood, then you get even more birds. And so I think that's really our goal. And although if we only work on our site, we're going to be limited as to what we can accomplish. This data shows that. And of course, it's a spectrum too. You're going from as I said, through so your crows and your pigeons to birds you might be more excited to see, like warblers and bluebirds and, and woodpeckers are the kinds of birds that are showing up more as we move towards these more green conditions. So, so we think we start to think about our yard as part of an ecological network, a nature network, if you will. And it's going to be most effective as we think of it as part of a system which actually I think some of the previous talks have talked about as well, and even what Melissa was doing. Um, and so we've thought then, we've di dived into the literature, the research on cities around the world to figure out, well, what are the elements to create that network of nature? And we found that there were seven major drivers of urban biodiversity that, that really control how well a city does in supporting wildlife. And so, um, those are, and I'll go through them quickly here and then in more detail, patch size, which is simply how big a patch of green space is, how well connected it is, the little things, um, the yards and street trees um, in between, the habitat types and structure that you're creating in those sites of green space, the amount of native plants, that's a key driver as we've been discussing. And then certain small, relatively small features that can be really important in species life cycles, which we call special resources, and then how you manage kind of a catch-all area. So I'm gonna go through each one of those briefly um, and say some of the implications for our work um, at the local scale. So starting with patch size. 
So the number one driver of biodiversity in general and urban biodiversity as well is how big a patch is. Bigger patches support more species more effectively. And that's actually one of the um, kind of the classic strongest ecological relationships is a species area curve. And we've looked at that in more detail for urban areas and classified patches in these different levels of benefit that we consider two acres and larger to be really called a patch that can support, kind of support its own self-sustaining species. But then when you get up towards 10 acres, you actually have accumulated a, a lot more species. And then you, many more sensitive species are only going to be found when you have these larger regional hubs. Um, like that's where hedgehogs reproduce in, in London is in a, in a large park like that. Um, so those are the kinds of, so we want to think about our area in that context. Um, and here's a little data to, to show you what I mean. Um, this is looking at breeding bird populations in Rome. And so as you increase the size of the park, as you look at parks of larger size on the lower, the X axis, you can see the number of species dramatically increased, um, especially as you go from zero to about, well, there's no park of zero, but from small parks to four hectares or so, 10 acres. Um, you started to kind of max out and hit like a threshold of how many birds you could support. So that becomes, you, you can see, so those are going to be the real drivers as we get these larger parks. And so you can look at your neighborhood, and this is me doing this for my South Berkeley neighborhood, and start to think about what is the ecological landscape or network you are part of. And in our neighborhood, the big drivers of biodiversity are going to be actually UC Berkeley campus, which is 130 acres, larger than 130 acres, and actually does have a lot of great habitats, um, including Strawberry Creek, a lot of oaks, um, and they've been actually restoring a lot, doing a lot of native landscaping, as well as Claremont Canyon on the right. And so what's happening in these places is going to create sort of the general context for biodiversity in my neighborhood. So being involved as as Melissa talked about, in those areas and what's accomplished there um, is going to make a big difference. But then at your even smaller scale, the local hubs are going to be important. And these in my neighborhood, probably most neighborhoods, tend to be local parks or schoolyards. And so what's done there can be a big driver. And um, so, for example, at Sylvia Mendez School, there are actually a fair number of native habitats. There's a, a, a willow. Uh, valley oak, uh, coast live oak, some native habitat areas, and a bunch of areas that actually could provide more habitat. So this really could, in theory, be as many schools probably could be a, a local node that would have more habitat that can you ever create in a yard, but then will kind of catalyze biodiversity in the whole neighborhood. So um, as Melissa again was saying, was you volunteering in the um, kind of land stewardship in the surrounding areas is, is a key element if you can do that. Um, and I think many schools, schoolyards and parks may be able to do that. And there's real health benefits to children as well from the excess to, to vegetation in terms of immune response um, and, and uh, shading and all sorts of things. So another interesting thing when, you, when I look at my neighborhood is that the biggest kind of potential area are these medians that are just grassy right now and are within the distance that research shows a larger space can definitely influence a smaller space. So if I really want to drive biodiversity in my yard and neighborhood, probably seeing what could be done there. Of course, these are bigger longer term processes, but um, this is how, you, this can be a big part of the, the um, of one strategy if you really want to be increasing biodiversity. So advocating for and stewarding habitat and neighbor nearby green spaces, these will drive biodiversity in your yard as well as, and this is obviously more challenging, advocating for the creation of new green spaces. Those are going to be rare, but there are many park poor areas in our cities that really do need those and, and should for equity, you know, equi equitable access to green space and nature really should be created. So that's an important element as well. So there's sort of this combination of local and, you know, and surrounding area. So the second big driver of biodiversity in cities are the connections. And I think that kind of makes sense intuitively that you've got your habitat areas and what's going to make a big difference is how well connected they are. Um, that's going to allow so the more mobile species to be more effective at moving back and forth, can take less calories, they're going to have less mortality, 
and it's going to help the less mobile species like beetles or you know spiders that are just drifting um, on threads it's going to help everybody be more successful and more um, you know have more use of the different resources that generally are often not going to be sufficient in the different small spaces if that makes sense so ideally these are greenways and riparian corridors but often it's going to be more um, streets along streets or stepping stones and there's a really wonderful example in san francisco led by the nonprofit nature in the city um, called the green hair street corridor which you may have heard about which um, is a great example it's taking patches they identified these these habitat patches bigger than two acres um, that support the butterfly which is rare um, almost extirpated in the city but it can't move between the patches because it is dependent it can only fly on the order of 200 meters in a generate 200 feet i think in a generation and needs a host plant be able to find a host plant in that distance so it literally needs stepping stones of buckwheat or deerweed and so they've been creating those um, in between the larger patches to create a corridor in this case it's a neat example of a corridor stepping stones and also focusing on a particular species um, where you really can make a difference which is something i'll talk about more another example is a really neat program in singapore um, which is a real leader in urban biodiversity and here they have identified streets going between two significant green spaces and then they try to max out the native habitat along that street with canopy layer understory and actually they supplement the existing street trees with native trees which is a really neat combination to get more canopy and more more high quality habitat i think they've done this between 29 or so um, i forget the exact number parks um, connected them in this way so um, in summary for to improve connections we can advocate for greenways and nature ways to even a step above arguably habitat is part of bike buffers and the slow streets movement so we're actually taking advantage of these you know shifts in mobility to bring in habitat and then we can also think very locally about our sites as stepping stones and pollinator pathways um, some neat work being done um, on that concept and even in my neighborhood i find that um, I, it seems like as people as research has talked about that monarchs are heading in a general north-south direction it does seem that they're generally passing through hopping from my milkweed to go across the street where we have another milkweed and so we're starting to try to set up that le somewhat linear pathway that you know a, a mother monarch could follow depositing eggs um, sequentially and have her choice of different different spots to lay eggs so this leads to the idea of matrix quality which um, it's probably my personal favorite um, which is is the the kind of cumulative benefit of the small areas and as you can see in these diagrams on the right um, those can increase the connectivity between patches they can essentially if you're well designed around a park or a habitat patch they can increase the habitat value or effective functional size of that habitat by having complementary habitat around it similarly for riparian corridors or in the bottom example we can actually create you know functional sort of distributed patches um, of themselves by um, by coordinating across sites so this idea of combining multiple spaces to create neighborhood nature nodes because generally most homes aren't going to be right next to a large park or riparian corridor so we need to create our own nodes of nature what we call a habitat complex and this is important because most species are going to need most wildlife is going to need more than one yard and so you need coordinated ecological improvements and uh, these are a few examples from our, uh, our, our a report we wrote called urban ecological planning guide with the open space authority silicon valley open space authority it's available online um, and it looks at a few species like acorn woodpecker or the arboreal salamander california sister which need can occupy fairly small spaces um, but still need a variety of resources like certain number of oaks or um, you know spacing between oaks close enough for the california sister so we can um, start to design our yard and think about it in that context to support particular species and um, 
And here's a quick personal example of, um, of how a habitat complex can start to develop in the neighborhood. This is our, the corner near my house where we have a traffic circle that City of Berkeley helped us build 15 years ago or so. And it's become a real source of neighborhood pride. Um, you can see it's decorated each holiday season. And um, the tree we planned out was a seedling oak and uh, is now quite huge. It has a bunch of native plants in the understory. And that gave neighbors the idea to start um, expanding that habitat along the parking strips to sort of radiate out from this, this little node. Um, and so this parking strip turned into this with California sagebrush and creeping wild rye and ceanothus and blue-eyed grass and um, a bunch of milkweed has a lot of caterpillars on it. And that led to um, our neighbor across the street, the neighbor across, this is across the street from us, this is down the street, up the street from us, saying, hey, can we do something similar in our yard, or in our parking strip? And then somebody else said, hey, these plants look good. I like these. These look really nice. Could we do that in our yard? So we started to generate surprising amount of um, ecology in these really small spaces. And it's continuing to lead towards more and more um, neighbors joining in um, that may be partly because my sons Joey and Leo are have been really amazing at, at digging up the, the weeds and planting um, the native plants but it's drawn in it has of course had this whole unexpected community benefit where I've gotten to know neighbors better um, this is a neighbor um, bringing us seedlings of blue-eyed grass from her yard and uh, we now putting we're putting in bulk orders for mulch and bulk orders for plants, at, you know, discounts. Um, so, and cumulatively, we've started to be able to add to, you know, what one can do at one's own yard. And I pretty much have ran out of space to add more native plants. Um, but starting to connect these relatively small parking strips, but cumulatively starting to add up to something. These are the ones in the works as well. And then that has started to lead towards front yards and backyards um, being turned into native habitat as well. So starting to build a bit of a habitat complex. So this leads towards that idea of coordinating with neighborhoods and combining backyards and front yards and parking strips and street trees. And it's led me to realize an interesting thing, which is while one can generally do more in your backyard because it tends to be bigger and you kind of, it's uh, like a little more contained. Um, you may get more pure habitat quantity. In a way, the front yard and the parking strip and these little public spaces may have, you know, much greater value because they can have influence and kind of spread throughout the neighborhood. And uh, the somewhat unfortunately named scientific research concept of social contagion, which doesn't sound that good nowadays, but the idea that, of course, what we do around each other influences each other. And that's really been the case here. I think it's just more of sort of a community um, engagement and like sharing concept. So the um, so thinking about the front the public facing spaces and the, the power of that to, to spread and kind of, um, you know, may build interest in these these kinds of activities. Um, and then the idea of t I mean, for particular species like right now with the crisis in monarch populations, we probably should all be planting as much milkweed as possible, uh, making as much resources as, as we can. Um, I see people talking about the pipe vine swallowtail and that, you, you know, we may not be able to get enough habitat in, in your own yard, but if many people did, you might be able to get self-sustaining populations. And then similarly, the acorn woodpecker, and I'll, I'll use that, will shift me to this next topic of habitat diversity. And so this is thinking about what, what are the larger plant communities and ecosystems that we're trying to create and leads us to thinking about historic ecology as I started. Um, and in the East Bay, we're often gonna be thinking about um, lost habitats are gonna be wildflower meadows and grasslands, um, oak savannas and woodlands, riparian corridors um, with streams and pools in them, and uh, willow groves in the wetter areas. And so we can start to think about, well, we re can't recreate these exact you know, views in our urban landscapes, think about how we can re reintroduce the different elements of them in the different spaces that we have access to. And one example of that is re-oaking, where we um, thought about the, the, all the functions and elements, components of an oak woodland ecosystem, and kind of translated that into how could that be accomplished in a neighborhood. 
in an urban setting. Um, you know, and it's a certain amount of oak trees to create the amount to support an acre woodpecker colony, which then can create cavities for the cavity nesters like bluebirds. It's having overstory and understory so that, you know, a butterfly, the California sister, um, that is uh, using oak leaves as a host has nectar um, when they're ready for it. Um, you also have the downed logs and leaf litter um, as part of that the ground level. Um, and then the spacing, because the oaks actually, their pollen doesn't move that far, so they need to be within a certain distance. So you can start to create a, um, you know, an oak, oak node, if you will, um, by thinking about the different functions. And then actually you support like an acorn col woodpecker colony in an urban setting, as you do see in places that have enough oaks and these different resources. So some of the elements that we want to think about from a habitat diversity perspective are having both the overstory. The trees are really important. They tend to be drivers. There's so much biomass in, in a tree that if you can support a tree, particularly an oak or a willow or cottonwood, that's gonna be a huge value. But then often the understory is missing um, or the shrubs are really important in, the, in research, that sort of vertical structure. And then thinking about the larger functional ecosystems that we might be able to create. It could be oak savannas and the lowlands, um, wildflower meadows, pollinator gardens, and the open sunny areas like, like that ex our example on the, along the street. Um, if you're near a creek, aiming for riparian trees and understory plants, because those corridors are often really restrained, so you can somewhat compensate for that by um, what you do in your yards. Um, and if you do have a high water table or other good water source, willows and cottonwoods, so those grows are really real oases, um, particularly in the late summer. Um, so if you can plant willows, they always show up as a, you know, one of the highest value um, species in, um, you know, in the butterfly host plants and, and pretty much every other metric, um, providing those. And for insectivorous birds, late in the summer, the leaves, those leaves are really palatable. So thinking about the habitats that we're creating. Now, I won't spend much time on native vegetation because we've talked about that a lot um, in these seminars and people are doing amazing things. Um, to meet all of these goals. But I will reinforce this point that I think Doug Tallamy made really well with his research and um, this research from Melbourne, residential Melbourne shows similarly, um, the kind of remarkable increase in um, the presence of native species and um, across many different types of wildlife as you go from 10 to 60, you know, really up to the 50 and 60% native vegetation, you can see the dramatic increases in bees, the blue line, beetles, the dashed orangish line, bats um, in the red, bugs, true bugs in the black line, and native birds in the yellow line, all going dramatically up as native, the proportion of native plants increases. And then correspondingly, the amount of exotic non-native birds dramatically went down. So you can see why um, scientists are putting out goals like 60 or 70, or you can see these numbers seem to still be going up for some of these um, fauna. You know, aiming for, you know, the majority, um, native plants is really going to drive ecosystem biodiversity. So, um, so as we think about the plants we're planting, thinking about um, their wildlife value, and one great source is the work of Doug Tallamy and Calscape that can help you figure out which plants are best for caterpillar host plants, which does have that cascading benefit for birds. You also take it another level and think about other species by looking at eBird and iNaturalist and seeing what's in your neighborhood and could be supported. Um, and you can look at species assemblages like aiming for multiple species of oaks in your neighborhood because they tend to produce acorns in different years. Um, so it's important to have a mix. Um, providing nectar and pollen continuously as, as, as much as possible, um, in particular late and early season nectar, um, which can be important and kind of a limiting factor. Um, and then perhaps a, a number of, of, of researchers point to having clumps or drifts of species, you know, not just one of every plant, but trying to aim for somewhat larger patches so that it's less energetic cost for species, like, you know, bees or butterflies to take advantage of those and actually easier to find and recognize as well. 
and support things like this ruby crown kinglet that my son Leo took a picture of. Um, special resources are next to the last um, item um, are things like ponds or large trees, small water features um, that can be really critical for species life cycles. Um, so large trees can have the cavities and the dead wood, um, which can also be sources of cavities and insects. It may be easier to preserve on private land where you can keep a piece or, um, or you know, actually put some effort into keeping these elements um, in your yard while making sure to be careful in terms of safety. Um, and then as uh, has, been, has been discussed, the value of bird boxes and bee boxes and um, those sorts of things can be quite significant. You wanna research a little bit which work well in your area and then water features, we have uh, relatively recently put in pond in our backyard, which is sort of still coming together. Um, Joey nicely took this picture just this morning. Um, and even in just sort of incipient form, it's attracted so many more species than we saw before. Golden crown sparrows bathing a lot um, a couple of months ago. Um, yeah, black eyed, the black phoebes, uh, dragonflies, which we hadn't seen before. And you can imagine that there used to be these streams in, you know, fairly regularly spaced in the East Bay, which would have pools and, you know, in spots over the summer. And just most of those are gone today. So you can imagine water is a real limiting resource probably in many places. And so providing that can be valuable. Um, and then I had to put this in just very small um, special resources like this hole in our somewhat dilapidated, it's, it's secure. Don't get me wrong, but um, you know, older wood on the deck, um, which is used by this carpenter beak, um, and a number of them using these holes in the deck, and uh, they've become a real source of enjoyment for us as a family. And I haven't been able to successfully create more holes that they've used, but we have recognized things to do to make those holes safer, like not having water, a pail of water nearby that it might fall into, keeping the cat, this is upstairs, but keeping the cat away from it. Um, so, and just maintaining those small resources and getting to know them and seeing what, how wildlife are even using your structure. So some of these actions include preserving old trees with cavities and deadwood, all these sorts of features for nesting, like bee boxes and bat boxes, which are super popular in England, the bee hotels. And then as, as Cassie and Melissa were talking about, logs, dead bogs, sticks, stick piles, leaf litter, and then ponds, mud puddles for butterflies to get nutrients, sand baths sometimes. Um, some of these features that can actually make a difference. And then my last, last element to discuss is management. This is a, a number of different things, which I think people have been talking about quite a bit in these sessions. But the one I'll focus on because it's getting a lot more attention recently is light pollution. Um, in this pay recent paper, it, it as a driver of insect decline, um, but also because it's rel somewhat tractable. It's uh, somewhat something that we actually can, can, like native plants, deal with at a local scale. Um, and so, the, the major um, factors to consider are the type of light. And this, this graphic shows how shielding light fixtures, light fixtures would just point the, the light down are you know, gonna waste much less light and uh, focus it where you need it and have less light pollution. Of course, what's even better is, is having as little light as you really need or have it on as little as you need with motion activated sensor lights. So that's the first step. And then the second step is what bulbs you're actually using or what kind of light you have, um, because it's the blue and white side of the spectrum, which is much worse for both wildlife and for humans. Um, and much of the research is actually about the effect on our own circadian rhythms. And that's why, you know, looking at screens before you go to bed is not good. So similarly, just not being surrounded by bluish light is gonna be better for people. And we want to get bulbs that are down in the 3000 or 2700 Kelvin temperature. And I have been noticing those are more available in, um, you know, in the hardware stores. Um, so it's just, if we all switch those out with those light fixtures over time, we make a pretty big difference in our neighborhoods. So particularly on insects. So reducing light pollution, um, darksky.org is a great resource. Um, and they actually have links to specific fixtures you can buy. Um, bird safe windows, we tend to think about more for 
office buildings, migratory birds, but can be an issue, you know, on one's own house, um, particularly if you're creating more habitat, you want to be aware of bird strikes um, and the treatments you can do on your windows. Noise pollution is an interesting one that I think we all became much more aware of during the pandemic when it just got so um, amazingly quiet. And the birds, research definitely showed birds taking advantage of that. <clears throat> that is somewhat hard to change at a local scale, but so hopefully these trends of slow streets and electric cars, fewer combustion engines will actually re gradually remove that major constraint on wildlife and as well as human health, make our neighborhoods quieter, which is going to add a whole nother dimension that's possible for urban biodiversity. And then the last bullet there is I think things we've discussed a lot in these sessions about how you maintain your landscape in terms of when you weed and, and prune and deadheading and leaving seeds and leaf litter and all those sorts of things. So in conclusion, um, as we think about our yard as, as being part of a node in the nature network, we might want to think about what's nearby, um, particular target species um, to guide us, um, aiming for cumulative benefits across the neighborhood, sort of the, the, the synergistic um, effect and that's part of creating ecosystems, really creating ecosystems, not just planting plants. So thinking about, um, you know, the larger patterns, uh, all the different resources, you know, special resources, water features, nesting resources, um, thinking really about ecosystems. And that, that's where what we're really trying to do. And that's, um, that's really challenging and complex, but I think we're hoping to provide some ways to start doing that. And I think many, as has been exemplified in, in all these yards we've been seeing. So in conclusion, I wanted to leave you with a few resources. Um, the first few are available on our website um, at the Urban Nature Lab at SFEI. Um, There's a great report done by H.T. Harvey and Google called Integrating Nature into the Urban Landscape that I think people would really love. Just Google that. Maybe we could put that resource, that link on there. Calscape is an amazing resource. Um, and Homegrown National Park, which leads to all of Doug Tallamy's research um, on butterfly hosts and, and moth hosts. And then Bringing Back Natives, you've got a lot of great resources on this website as well. So I wanted to thank um, and many colleagues uh, at SFEI um, and collaborators in other entities and partners and funders uh, in this work. And finally, thank you um, all for watching and being interested and invested. Um, this is a case where individual actions really can make a difference. So thank you. Okay, Robin, thank you very much. So uh, we have a number of questions and I look forward to talking with you for the next few minutes. So let's see, the dark skies at night. I, uh, I had not heard of dark skies at night until I heard Doug Tallamy's talk. And for those of you who have not heard Doug Tallamy speak, if you go to the Garden Tours YouTube page, uh, Doug Tallamy was the keynote speaker for this tour on April 25th. And he gave a slightly different but same message talk last year. It's also on the tour's YouTube page, and he is such an inspirational and informative speaker. So um, I just encourage people to go there and hear him speak. But um, we ourselves, after hearing him, um, got uh, Dark Skies at Night certified lights. So you can buy them at Home Depot, and it's just a light that has a cap on it. So the light shines down, not up. And we even were able to uh, get one. We're required now with a new remodel to have a, um, our numbers to be lit from the street, but we were able to find a number uh, sign that also had the little cap on it. So it meets the criteria. And we have put, we have motion sensors, so we don't leave our night lights on at night. We use our motion sensors. And can I say something about bird strikes? So we just did this big remodel. So we, we tried to think of all these things as we were working in our house. We put in double hung windows specifically because we could get exterior screens. Casement windows don't have exterior screens and birds won't fly into windows with exterior screens. They don't see the glare. So we put up our double hung windows and screens. And then for our big picture window, we found from a company called Collide Escape, 
like I'm going to escape a collision, collide escape, a bird screen that can go over a large picture window that um, functions as a screen. And so we have buried, we hope, our last bird here on Hillcrest Road. So uh, we did have on the garden tour, have had for a number of years, a cluster of sort of habitat nodes, as you called them, in Richmond. It was Dave Drummond and Margo Cunningham and Nita uh, Pereira and Paul Carr, who um, worked together. They're within a few houses of each other in the Richmond Annex uh, to help each other with their own gardens. And then they began gardening and helping neighbors up and down the street. And so I'm familiar with their project. But Robin, can you tell us a little bit more about some of the community aspects, like how did it happen? How did you get neighbors who wouldn't normally think about putting natives in their garden to, to do so? Yeah, right. Um, good question. That's great. I'm gonna reach out to Margo about, I knew she'd done amazing things. So uh, that's could be a good example for us. Um, when I saw a question on this, um, you know, I, our approach has been just kind of, um, somewhat unintentional, it's just sort of happened um, pretty organically. Uh, I think from being out there on the street, there's, it's interesting how how much people appreciate improving the streetscape, like improving these crappy parking strips. You know, they just, you get a lot of people stopping by and asking questions and I think observing what's happening. And then, so we didn't, they ask any neighbors to do this. It was all people saying, well, could we do that on mine? I just have this crappy grassy area, you know. Um, I've been wondering what to do. You know, if I think a lot of these people don't know like what plants to do or how to do it. Um, and maybe don't know if it's gonna look good or not. So I think we realize we have to make sure they keep looking good um, for it to be successful. But it it has purely been an organic, just people um, you know, being curious and then saying, hey, can I do that so far? In fact, <laughs> to your point, the one time I have tried to be more pushy and didactic, that didn't go anywhere. Um, you know, because people have, they are people's yards and people are very, um, you know, have their own desires and wishes. But I do think it's interesting, the front yard and the parking strip as a semi-public space, maybe as a place that's safe to kind of, it's sort of in between, you know, public and private. And so I think maybe that's been part of what's worked for us is that that's a good place to collaborate. And then that maybe leads people to want to do more of that in their own personal space. I know with that's Dave Drummond and Margo and Anita, they began by working on their own yards, but they were also all of them great propagators and they gave mm -hmm. plants away that's, to their neighbors. And that's even a great point. started planting some of their neighbors, like if the neighbor just wasn't invested in their parking strip they just began kind of working themselves up and down the street. They also held open houses, open gardens, where they would, wow. you know, offer neighborhood tours. And they, they told me that one time they had 30 people coming through on their, their little neighborhood tour. And they had success with uh, both of their own effort with gardening on other people's parking strips. And then some people also became interested and in, um, changed their own gardens. Yeah, well that, you know, that's probably, to be fair, probably part of it has been that, that I have two sons, 10 and 15, Leo and Joey, who've been, um, who have also offered to dig up people's <laughs> parking strips and, um, and plant them. So that is pretty irresistible, I think, if you got is motivated, <laughs> like they would actually do it for you. Um, and so that has been, I think, yeah, a little bit of help probably. And, you know, that's been fun for us because we have a small lot and, um, don't have that much space to work with. So to get to try out different things and actually have a bigger, bigger room to work with people on. That's been it really sounds like fun. a good way to meet your neighbors too. Have you met more friends and more Well, neighbors? that's the thing. I know I hadn't realized it's actually even probably more exciting. I'm really into native plants, obviously. Like that's my whole like, you know, focus, but it's probably been even more exciting than neighborhood relationships. Like, yeah, it really is true. Urban greening. And there's a lot of research about urban greening and the value of that for um, for social interactions and, and then this health benefits of that. And it's really true. Like you end up sharing things more and like helping each other out when you're away from vacation or, um, and some of those relationships are developed because of doing these little projects together, you know, giving each other lemons, you know, borrowing tools, all the sort of things that actually are part of community resilience and stuff. I think 
uh, that's been in some ways an even more exciting part. I mean, equally exciting to the ecology of it. So there's a question here about um, how close do oaks need to be planted to be close enough for the California sister butterfly? Um, I think what we cited in our, in re-oaking Silicon Valley, the, the report which gets into this more is on the order of 500 meters. Um, so it's, you know, it's, it's hundreds of feet um, away. So, and that, that number is also though thinking about the pollen um, distance, the distance that pollen goes. So oaks are wind pollinated, of course, but surprisingly the pollen doesn't go that far. And so if you have oaks that are, you know, thousands of feet apart, they are pretty much isolated from each other. So there's um, so interesting research about that. So that proximity is important both for the butterfly and for um, the oaks themselves to be healthy and uh, produce. For people who did not watch the last couple of weeks, um, Doug Tallamy spoke on April the 25th and gave his great talk. On May the 2nd, I gave a talk on keystone species uh, from the San Francisco Bay Area using Dr. Tallamy's data and um, described some of the species that we could use on May 2nd on shady areas. And on May 16th, I gave a similar talk on our own local keystone species, which are the plants that are the most valuable for wildlife for sunny areas. So you could also find some uh, information there. And we also have on the homepage of the garden tour, a link called Doug Tallamy Resources. And um, if you go there and click into that link, you'll find um, Doug Tallamy's list of um, the, the Bay Area plants and the number of species of butterflies and moths that can lay eggs on those and several other plant lists that would be useful for you when you're thinking about creating your own garden as a habitat node and kind of branching out from there. Um, let's see. I'm just reading all the comments. A lot of fascinating stuff. Well, feel free and you see something you want to respond to, Robin. I'm reading them too. Um, attracting native birds. Um, you need native plants to attract native birds. Didn't you talk about that a little bit, Robin, with the mm -hmm. uh, number of birds that you can attract or the number of species, not the number of birds, but it's the number of species of birds, right? Mm -hmm. I know. Well, we, uh, go ahead. The, you mean the Melbourne research that I showed? Yeah. That was the, um, the the occupancy, the the likelihood of finding um, a species in your site, and it actually it was kind of a it was a really interesting study because it was bees, butterflies, true bugs, bats, you know. So it goes beyond just the butterfly stuff. It showed that the benefits across all these different categories of wildlife. So that's pretty neat. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think you know I think this debate about native and non-native is always challenging. And of course, there are non-native plants that can, yeah, every plant probably has some value um, and some have more than others, some non-natives. But I think the research is pretty clear that in general, native species are going to support many more native wildlife species. Um, and it is, you know, it, it, it's um, not that you necessarily want to get rid of all non-native species, but the more you can shift that proportion to the native species, it's just going to support more native wildlife. And I think Doug Tallamy, he explains it really well, just in terms of the adaptation. Um, it, it's tough to digest leaves. And like, we can't eat most of these leaves of non-native or native plants. So they have fairly specialized um, abilities to digest plants that are based on evolutionary relationships. And so many of the non-native plants we plant are essentially like plastic plants for, for wildlife. They're just not, not edible. So they're not useful. You know, they may be still useful for structure and carbon storage and cooling and some of the other benefits, but you would do better to have native plants doing those benefits and supporting the ecosystem. You know, we saw that in our own yard when I first moved into this house and we had lawn, ivy, weird South African plants, uh, Himalayan blackberry, and then after we changed our garden, and we, we didn't see anything really going on in the backyard at the time, but since we converted our garden to natives, we have seen 30 species of birds in my little lot in San Pablo. It's been very exciting. Wow, wow. Yeah, there was a question about window treatments and that's a kind of complicated topic. You gave a good example of window treatment and there are, um, you know, surface, um, you know, decals or, um, or 
uh, screening. Yeah, you know, screens, yeah, or um, lines that you can put on um, post facto. Because, yeah, getting, you know, I think a lot of cities are pushing for like the larger office buildings to get that hardwired into the glass, right? So there's, it's called frit. So there are these kind of imperceptible lines, grids that birds see. Mm -hmm. um, that's generally, I don't see people generally doing that with residential buildings, but, you know, if you do have a window, you might want some treatment on it. Well, in, we in American Bird Conserva Conservancy is the source ABC yeah. for a lot of the research and guidance on that. So that's a website maybe that could be put up. Kind yeah, of cool. We had a big stuff. bird collision problem at our house before we remodeled, and we had three. We buried three birds in six months, and so we were determined when we moved back into the house we will have buried our last bird. So we really and we haven't had any collisions since we've been back home with our kaleidoscape screening and our. Uh, screening on the double hung windows, which has really been a relief. Well, Robin, we okay. are, I am sorry to say, out of time, but it was great to have you with us today. Might you be able to stick around and answer some of these questions on Zoom or YouTube? Yeah, yeah, I can do that. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanna keep looking at these questions. Thanks everyone for all the great comments. Well, thank you so great much work. for taking the time to be with us today. It's nice to have yeah. you. See you Thanks, again, Kathy. Robin. Likewise. Okay. okay.